Romani and Edwards with Maz. Uh, joining us now is a friend, dear, dear, dear friend of mine. Also, he is extremely talented at what he does. He works for Fox Sports as well as the best host and pregame show there is. Big Noon kickoff. Brady Quinn, how you been, man? It's been forever. BQ. I know. It, it feels like it's been a while, but thanks you've been, for You've me been running from me. <laughs> I, no, 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 no. You know, we... We're just adjusting to life with four little kiddos. Uh, it's been probably Ooh. one of the biggest adjustments I've had to make in life. So uh, it's been a lot of fun, but definitely an adjustment for my wife and I, man. How are you now, guys doing? Uh, we're doing real good, man. Four kids. Like, when's when's the, the Brady time? When do you get a little, a little plot of space for yourself? Usually when they're in school, which we've got okay. three of the four in school right now. Uh, oh, I, our son probably won't be old enough next year to send him to preschool. So i uh, still be hunkering down with one, at least at home. But, uh, yeah, usually during that period of time when they're in school, that's where we get to have a little bit of fun. You'll be proud, Brady. Uh, you know, every time I'm looking at you and we get a chance to see each other, I'm like, I got to start working out again because whatever I'm doing, it's not working. I got to look like my brother. So I've been back in the gym six months strong, man. You happily know that uh, I look something like Brady Quinn, man. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> I don't even know why you try to get, I, I've seen you before. You are a Adonis. So I'm not yeah. sure why we're even having this competition right now. Yeah. If anything, I need to get back on the, on the weight treatment. I've been probably trying to play too much golf, which has gotten in the way of my, my training and lifting like I'd like to be doing right now. Yeah, I picked up a golf club. It didn't go too well the other day. I think I'm still thinking about the weights uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, joining me with my host today, Ryan Zao, is Anson Wells. He's Michigan State guy, legend, as it relates to the heckling business in the NBA. Uh, Michigan State, Notre Dame. Big rivalry out of you guys. Tell me your favorite Michigan State moment. <laughs> I know oh. where we're going. I set you up. I don't like Anson, by the way. <laughs> Anson, the problem is like the last year I was there, so I've been in the 2006 game in East Lansing. Awesome comeback. But it wasn't one of my favorite games only because, you know, I didn't play that great, especially in the first half. I mean, was it Jeff Samarjan and Anson? Jeff Samarja, he was there. Remy McKnight as well. Remy had a few big catches and plays. John Carlson, our tight end, had a few big catches and plays in the comeback. Um, but, you know, that one doesn't stand out to me. The first trip I had to East Lansing in 2004, that one sticks out. Um, that was a uh, – that, I guess, the very first one. Even though we, we lost my freshman year when Michigan State came to East Lansing, it was really the most significant reps that I got. And they put me in on the two-minute drive as we were down trying to come back. And so I let us down on a touchdown drive. We didn't get the onside kick, uh, but it was basically my job from that point moving forward uh, for the rest of my time at Notre Dame. So that final drive, we ran like a little Z drive concept. We were running on the West Coast. So it was Ray McKnight coming from right to left on the shallow cross. They brought uh, Sam Mike, right? So kind of a yeah. fire zone, blitz zone, what the terminology is. And he had you know, the backside end kind of dropped past him and there was just all this open green grass. So it drifted back through it to him. He kind of ran for the touchdown. That one really stands out, but it was just, it was always a great rivalry, but it was Michigan state, yeah. Michigan. Um, those were physical matchups and always, always tough matchups for us. It's crazy. Growing up, I actually thought that Michigan and Notre Dame was a huge rival, which it is. Don't get me wrong, but my time at Michigan and the little past that Michigan and Michigan, I mean, excuse me, Michigan state and Notre Dame's rivalry was better than Michigan and Notre Dame's rivalry. So I always appreciate and respect that you guys rivalry. I know we don't have you for long. Look, so let's jump into it. Uh, you have been a guy that's been on the Detroit Lions from the beginning. You've talked about Dan Campbell. You've talked about what they were going to do. Here they are three years into Dan Campbell's situation. They get to the NFC Championship. They get this close. Did the Lions get better in the offseason? They were one of the four teams last year trying to get better in the offseason. Free agency, DJ Reader. They bring in Davenport. They bring in Carlton Davis. The draft, they go after the secondary position. Terry and Arnold out of Alabama. Ennis Rakestraw out of Missouri. Did the Lions become better, and do you think they're a team that should be favored to win the Super Bowl? Uh, I don't know that I put them at number one. Because I think they're I mean, three. I'd, put them somewhere, yeah. I'd, I'd probably put them somewhere in the top five, top six. And, and the only reason I say that is because, you know, we saw what they did last year. And I think, you know, you and I both know, B, from just playing in the NFL, how hard it is to make that incremental improvement. And when you get to the NFC Championship game, you sit there and you're like, dude, we're that close. We were right there. You know, it, it's about taking that next step, you know, and, and it's really hard to do sometimes. And sometimes luck and things that are out of your control has to play a factor too. But you, you hit the nail on the head with as far as what they did in the offseason. They had to address some of the defensive issues, and they did that, in particular in the secondary. So that's been shored up. Yes, you got some young players, but I think guys who can step up right away and be day one starters for them. And I think the thing that I love the most, really about Brad Holmes and, and what he did, and Dan Campbell, what they did, it was with the business. Like a lot of these teams, like look at the Dallas Cowboys right now. 
Like CD Lamb's deal's not done. Dak Prescott's going to his final year. A lot of pressure on Mike McCarthy going to his final year. Like you have all this stuff up in the air. Distractions. And you know, exactly. And, it, and sometimes that business bleeds onto the field. And you look at what the Lions did. Amara St. Brown gets his extension. Pace Sewell gets his extension. Jared Goff, like everyone gets taken care of. And it's like you don't have distractions. You don't have any of those things to be concerned about. Guys not being there. Guys frustrated about the business side of it. I love that. Like, I love that Detroit's like, dude, we're in this window of success. Let's go for it. Let's sign these guys. Let's make them happy. And by the way, like, you save money that way. Yeah, you know, Amon Ross St. Brown's deal was great. But, like, you see all these receivers who are signing after him because now they're going to try to one-up him. And so it's not that that makes his deal a bad deal. It, it's still a great deal. It's just yeah. a matter that Detroit Lions realized they weren't going to sit around. They weren't going to wait and allow the market to basically dictate how much they're going to have to pay these players. So I love everything they've done this offseason. Obviously a big Dan Campbell fan, big Lions fan, yeah. and what they're going to be capable of. But it's can they do it again two years in a row? That's tough to do. Hey, uh, Brady, it's Maz. It's good to have you on again. Hey, two divisions that catch my eye. Uh, I think the two best divisions in football is the AFC North and our NFC North. Out of those eight teams, I mean, the AFC North, even with Pittsburgh, I think all four of those, if the, if the chips fall right, they all can make the playoffs, including your old team and Braylon's old team, the <laughs> Cleveland Browns. What do you say about those two divisions? I mean, I would say the Cleveland Browns have the best roster, but in regards to the, of all those teams, but in regards to the divisions, look, to me, it's the AFC North and then kind of everyone else. And it's no disrespect to any other division of football, but you can't tell me. I mean, right now, you kind of look at the Bears and go, okay, they got Caleb Williams, they had Keenan Allen, um, you know, they, they, they add some additions to like Allen on defense as well. But we've got to see it first. Like, can they yeah. have a winning record? I'm just yeah. talking playoffs. Detroit did what they did. Green Bay's young, had a great second half of the season. Minnesota is kind of in a rebuild year cap-wise. We'll see what J.J. McCarthy becomes. If they get Justin Jefferson's deal done, Dallas Turner, can he be the you know, impactful player Daniel Hunter was? So Ooh. I just think there's more questions in the NFC North compared to the AFC North. You know, any one of those teams can, I think, make a playoff run, but all of them can make the playoffs. And if you're questioning Pittsburgh, like – I'm a buyer in Pittsburgh. I don't know how people yeah. keep questioning Mike Tomlin. I mean, yeah. all the guy yeah, does is win. Plays winning. Done. And he's got defense. He's got the run game. I do think Russ will be better in Arthur Smith's system in Pittsburgh. Like the, the downside of Mike Tomlin was his stubbornness and his loyalty to not want to get rid of Matt Canada. Oh, my and, God. And finally, so now that opens everything up for them. So I think Russ will be great in the system. Pittsburgh's going to be tough. If Deshaun Watson can stay healthy, that's the biggest question. But if not, like, and I'm a believer in Jameis Winston. Yeah. yeah. Well, that could be it. But, like, if Jameis gets his shot, with that talent they have out around them, now you got Jerry Judy to go with Amari Cooper, uh, Elijah Moore, David Njoku. I mean, that is as good of a roster as you're going to find. It just comes down to quarterback play. And the defense was lights out last year. We know what Baltimore can be. We've seen that. They make it to the AFC okay. Championship game. They can Joe Burrow stay healthy. If he can stay healthy, we know they're a contender, too. So, to me, it's the AFC North and kind of the rest of the league as far as the toughness of the divisions. Yeah, Amen. T. Higgins will definitely be paying to get that contract next season. But, you know, uh, yeah, 100%. It's, it's going to be interesting in the AFC North, Anson. Brady, summer of 2009, there's two guys in Cleveland, and they both want out. There's a lot of talk about <laughs> both of them maybe going to New York. Now, we're pretty familiar here with uh, Braylon's love for the city of Cleveland. Can you just speak on that and how you guys were both thinking you might be in New York? So I didn't think I'd be in New York at that moment. I actually thought uh, rumors were when I was in like training camp, I was going to get traded to Denver, which, you know, Braylon had, had been in the NFL longer than I had. That was really the first time I'd experienced anything like that. You know, I was in a quarterback competition. I was more focused on that, the offense, everything else. I still remember basically what solidified my opportunity to start that year was hitting Braylon in a preseason game versus I think there was the Tennessee Titans, was Titans. on a skinny post. It was Michael yeah, Jackson's was uh, birthday. <laughs> Which is the no. most random fact. No, no, the only reason I know that because he died. Ooh, ooh. He died that summer. And then in that preseason game, I caught a touchdown on his birthday because I did the Michael Jackson on his, on his uh, toes. So I I, <laughs> you, you, it was out, you know, he had a little toe drag thing. Yeah, there it is. All right. So I didn't remember that part of it, but I do remember throwing him a touchdown pass. And like, that was kind of like the moment that sealed it. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I was going to be able to get the start. Thank God. But uh, it, it was crazy. And, and the hard thing was, is we go, what, was it three or four weeks in the season B, then you get traded? Yep, four. And I, I, I'll never forget, <laughs> I called B's cell phone. 
And he's always got Frank Sinatra, New York, New York play. And that's just I like told his you, man. Voice. I love it. I told you. I changed it right away, man. Quick. I was so excited. Quick. So I obviously wanted to wish him good luck. Um, it put me in a tough spot. We had a couple of young rookies that year that who really stepped into the role as the lead receivers. And, and that's obviously not easy, especially first year, you know, first uh, first year you know, head coach there in Eric Van Gia, new system with, with Brian Dable. So it was it was all kind of new to all of this. But uh, that was one of the funnier things. <laughs> this, it was that quick. News hit me and already changed the board. Yeah. They have been quick. He left man. all his gear there. He didn't even go back for his. Uh, he he left. A, I think an Apple computer there. He, he didn't I, even go I back. Sony Vio. He yeah. knows that because uh, Annette. He know Annette became my aunt. Annette grabbed. Annette grabbed all my stuff for him. <laughs> That's a funny story. Go ahead, Brady. Brady you're a quarterback guru. Yeah. I got to ask you. We're all wondering about Hendon Hooker. If he's healthy this season and enters the draft in those first twelve picks with the other six quarterbacks, where does he fit in? Ah, it's hard. It's, it's hard to kind of figure that out. I mean, statistically speaking, obviously he put up a lot of numbers there in Tennessee, and that's kind of what that off- offense is known for a bit. Um, you know, he was experienced, older guy. I, you know, maybe you start to talk about him more along the lines of like Bo Nix. Uh, but, you know, it's tough. Like this class, Caleb was by far and away number one in my mind. Uh, I would have put Drake May up there. I thought his, his season two years ago was pretty special. And you got a sense of really how just good he was and what he was dealing with out around him. Um, you know, J.J. McCarthy just wins. I mean, a lot of yeah. people are frustrated. So much with the stats, all we've talked about that. But every time he needs to make a play, he does. Um, you know, Michael Penix, to me, had the second best tape of anyone this year. Like, I loved watching him in Washington the what, past what do, few years. What do you think about that pick? I, and I just got to pick your brain real quick because I was going to ask you that anyway. Atlanta, what are they doing? Were they right? Were they wrong? What do you think about that? I, I would say this. If your biggest issue is the quarterback position, which is why ultimately they moved on from Arthur Smith and why you know they made changes there, then you addressed it. <laughs> you did it in two ways. Where you, you know you've got Kirk Cousins, who's proven to have a certain amount of success so far in the NFL, and then you've got a guy you really love. And if you love that guy, go draft him. And let him yeah. learn from a guy who's a pro, right? Like, allow Michael Penix to continue to learn that system and grow. And, and also, like, you never know how Kirk Cousins will come back from an Achilles tear. Like, we all assume everyone's going to be able to play in their 40s like Tom Brady. And you obviously saw the injury to Aaron Rodgers last year. Yeah, it's going to get interesting. So it's kind of a thought that, like, hey, man, there's still some risk there. So why not address this position, at both old and young, and then we've got a cover. We don't have to worry about this because if you don't have a quarterback, you don't have a shot. They've got two now. So uh, it will put more pressure on Kirk Cousins. But, look, he's he's put pressure on himself. He's played into free agency years. He's played under franchise tags. He stepped up every single time. So I, I don't doubt that he'll be fine this year. And I think Penix will grow a lot and learn a lot from Kirk Cousins. Uh, but I honestly didn't have as big of an issue with it as everyone else. Like, everyone's acting like it was their money that they had paid it, Kirk Cousins. Exactly. $100 million. <laughs> Well, like if that's the prerogative, let them do it. Like ultimately, you know, you look at their their front office, you look at Raheem Boris. If it doesn't work, they're the ones that pay the price. You ain't lying. But, but I actually did. Yeah. Hey, we could talk NFL all day with you, Brady, but I gotta take it over to college for a minute. Can you please explain to me what it means the NIL versus now they're gonna let college teams pay their players? I'm I'm completely lost, man. You, you, what do you got for me? Yeah, we've, we've really complicated it because we had to give what has always existed, this acronym, this NIL, right? It's just marketing. That, that's what it was supposed to be. People tend to forget that what they were ultimately trying to do was say that student athletes who played a sport, who are really good at their sport, could go sign marketing deals or sponsorship deals with different corporations right. to go be on a commercial or go promote something. What happened was then entities started to were created to then create the, create those opportunities for student athletes. And it wasn't supposed to be pay to play, but that's essentially what it became because that's what you had to do in order to be able to retain your roster that you currently have and recruit. And so because that was the world that everyone had to live in, everyone's doing it. And everyone realized this wasn't the intent, but that's where we are. So what they do, now they're going to have a revenue share and it will start here about a year from now where student athletes will get paid essentially what is almost like a salary cap. Each university is going to be subject to uh, distribute the funds and money however they see fit, which will be interesting to take a, take a look at once it, it actually goes into effect. But the, the, the question mark that's still out there is the collectives. And in what way will they exist if they still will be able to exist? We know the IRS has sent out letters 
um, that have, have cautioned those that are nonprofits that they might not have their tax exempt status. So that could potentially change. But what about the for profit entities? You know, because you still have this group of alumni networks that are out there that might say, hey, we want this player. Let's go offer him X amount of dollars to come show up at a birthday party uh, where he shows up, does his deal, paid for it in exchange. Is the IRS, is the federal government going to create, you know, some sort of federal law that's going to prohibit that? Those are the questions that still exist that we don't know. So it's awesome that the players now, or student athletes, I should say, are getting a piece of, of the pie. But there's still so many things to be sorted out between now and then. And how does the how do the collectives, how does NIL in, in the what it was supposed to be, not pay for play, but truly marketing deals, how does that play a factor or play a role? Is it only football or is it basketball? You know, the other sports are going to be like, hey, oh. hey, where's mine? You know, it, 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 they don't deserve it. It's football and basketball. It's football. Hey, Brady, Brady. Maz is, Maz is not speaking for me, ladies and gentlemen. If I was too high, he speak for myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he doesn't speak for me either. Uh, I just watched our, our Notre Dame against lacrosse team with back-to-back national championships. They've been very active hey. in the NIL space. And, and so I, I hope programs like them are, this are able to benefit from it because we should always reward excellence. Um, and but but the question you asked here's the answer: We don't know. Let's yeah. say, for example, everyone's getting twenty million. That university, that athletic department, is going to decide how they want to allocate those funds, and so they can then spread those out over you know eighteen million to the football team if they yeah. want, yeah, or the two million for the rest, or they can say, hey, we're going to give ten million to football, ten million to the other sports. And this is how we're going to divvy it up. And then, you know, the athletic department, the coaches, the general managers now, we've got that title popping up in college sports. They would then discern and say, this is how much we need to compete. This is how much we're going to spend on our starters, backups, et cetera. This is what it's going to look like. So uh, moving towards, hopefully that answered your question. Yes. Hey, Brady, look, man, we appreciate you for joining us. So I'm going to let you go. But I'm going to ask you one quick question, one last one. NFL draft, six quarterbacks go in the top 12 picks, I do believe. Did the NFL teams get it right? with the six quarterbacks? Yes, because I think they had to. Okay. You know, in fact, I, I think if you're looking at the Las Vegas Raiders right now, you had Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell. I mean, that couldn't have been plan A. Or <laughs> maybe even plan B. Like, did, you, did, you hear, did you hear what Terry and Arnold said? Terry and Arnold said, uh, Antonio Pierce said, told him he flipped the coin to see if it was going to be Brock I, Bowers. I, I, it could be a little extra, but just yeah. throwing it out there. Someone might have said, hey, it was a coin flip, you know, and since someone takes that literally. Take literally, like, yeah. Literally, like we just heard news too. Uh, the special teams coach had said in a meeting, "Hey, anyone can play. You know, special teams. That's how you make this roster. Even Justin Fields could play it, right?" Oh. And Jalen Warren says it on a podcast, and then it gets out to the media, and the media is like, "Well, they're going to use J Justin Fields as a return man. Are they going to use him on special teams?" <laughs> no, it, it just it's a it's a matter of speech, right? right? It's like coach talk. So it's a joke. It's I, a locker room talk. I don't buy into that, but I'll, I'll say this. I don't think the draft went how Las Vegas wanted it to go. And I think they're in a really, really tough spot because they do have a good roster. I like Antonio Pierce. And Gardner Minshew allowed the Colts to be competitive last year with the Anthony Richardson injury in Indy. But, man, that's a – we'll see. I mean, this is a great opportunity for Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew, whoever, whoever wins that out. But um, I, think, I think a lot of other teams cook quarterbacks because they had to. What's Denver going to do? If they, don't, if they don't have Bo Nix, who else are you starting? Jarrett Stidham? Yeah, I mean, no, who are you looking at? Who feel good about this? Yeah. Brady, what do you think of the new kickoff rule? I've got more curiosity about it more than anything else. Um, I, I, I like the fact we're keeping the kickoff as part of the game. It just it would be weird to not have a kickoff, but then say we're kicking off at this time because no one would be watching that, right? So I'm glad it's a part of the game. I do think there'll be some teams that utilize the formations and utilize personnel. I mean, look at the, uh, the uh, rugby player that the Kansas City Chiefs have yep. signed. Mm -hmm. uh, his name's escaped me at the moment, but this dude can fly. And they've already, like, everyone's talking about Xavier Worthy because he's 40 yard dash time at the combine and Hollywood Brown. Th this is the most interesting storyline to me is like, how do they use this kid? Because he can absolutely fly. And you're he's talking the right guy at 23 miles per hour with no pads on, running through dudes. So he's going to be a kick return specialist. And he, he could end up being a really important piece of the field position battle and maybe put up some big plays. So I, I think I'm a fan of it now, but I, I want to reserve the right to wait and see how it's implemented. He is Notre Dame legend. He is Fox analyst legend. And he's also my good friend. Brady Quinn, always appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, man, because you didn't have Thanks, to. Brady. Thanks, so much, brother. Good time, guys. Enjoy the rest of the week. Appreciate it. Season's you, man. coming up. We'll talk some Sharon Moore later. I know Enjoy there's a lot of Michigan kids. questions. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get to those in August.
Hey, we're going to be there week two. We'll be in Ann Arbor. Woo, we'll take on Texas. Texas. We'll Let's go. That. If you have yeah. some time, maybe we can grab a bite to eat. For sure. Let's do it. Say less. See you, Brady. All right, brother. Yes. Always fun to have BQ on the show. Look, man, he is tremendous at what he does. And you get a quick feel, like, Anson. Like, we've had him on the show numerous times. But as soon as he gets in, he dials into what's going on. Oh. You don't really have to ask him questions. Because the questions I want to ask him about the quarterbacks, he answered them. You ask him questions about your division, he broke down the AFC North like no other man. Anson Wells, what do you think about it? He's just been a polished pro yeah. since his days in South Bend to the so NFL to now in the broadcast booth. I can't wait to call my buddy after this show and tell him who I got to interview today because that's yeah. just his favorite. Yeah, I, I, I tried to crack a joke by asking what was his favorite moment. I want him to go to that Samaritan game. I, tried. I, forgot he, I forgot he didn't necessarily have the best game that game, but they won, though. Well, wait a second. He was anointed, he said, in East Lansing. It's a beautiful place, Braylon. Yeah, it didn't happen in Arbor because he got in in Arbor and didn't go to it. <laughs> <laughs> We make so much about the offseason. We see PFF, the grades. We see ESPN, the grades. We see my 33rd team, the grades. Shout out to Ari Mayroff, big, big, big uh, fan and brother of the show. We see these things and we get excited, but there are still real questions. Why did DJ Reader not get the deal in Cincinnati? Why did Davenport not get the deal in Minnesota and stay there? Are we going to be okay with Emmanuel, I mean, Emmanuel Mosley who got injured last year and we gave him another contract to come on this year? There are still some real good questions that we want to see answered. We believe that this is the team. We believe that they answered those needs in the right way. But this is football. Just like we got better, everybody else got better, and we got to see if those moves really pan out. So I'm excited, very optimistic, but I do think they got better. Last year you had leaks, right? You had leaks in the secondary, which led to <laughs> the quarterback not getting knocked on his rear end, okay? Dan Campbell spoke about this team. Yesterday, he spoke about the secondary, how they're new, how he doesn't even know how to put a lineup together. Check this out. It's a great place to be in. We have so many options right now, so much competitiveness. AG and we're talking about it again. Uh, AG and I were the other day. Brad and I are talking about it every evening. I mean, it's like, I mean, um, you know, the talent level, the competitiveness, the versatility. Like, honestly, we have no idea who our starting lineup's going to be right now, and it's exciting. It's so good. Like, there's no telling who's going to be our outside corners, who's going to be our nickel, who's going to be our safeties. I mean, we, this, this thing is wide open across the board, um, and it's going to be great to let these guys compete and just go after it and see who, who goes and is going to be the most reliable guys for us, most dependable. So it's exciting. Ryan, we talked about this team as they start to get better. You said this, and that's why I want to throw it right to you. You said once they were 9-8, and eight, hey, we're going to have to face the facts. This is becoming a good team. Some good players aren't going to make this roster. We're not going to be able to have all the good players yep. stay on the team because we got better players. And that's exactly what's going on. That's exactly what Dan Campbell was talking about. Hey, look, it's an open roster because if you look at our roster, we got some talent. We got some talent. One of the jobs of any coach is to figure out how to get the most amount of talented players on the field at one time. You have a ton of talent on that defensive backfield now with uh, the two draft picks, first and foremost. And yep. we won't even, you know, Terry and Arnold and Ennis Reg Regstraw. Yeah. Them aside, then you've got uh, Brian Branch from a year ago. Then you've got um, uh, Carlton Davis and Amik Robertson. You've got five players. Don't forget Mello about Fawanu. Kirk, don't forget about Kirby Joseph. That's oh, six. I forgot about him. Melifonwu, <laughs> fine, but that's seven. I, I'm just gonna go. With, forget about Melifonwu for Why? a second. Just one second. And look at those six players that I just named. And Melifonwu wasn't even one of them. If you want to add him, seven players. How many of those guys can you get on the field at one time? I don't know. You know, and, and, you know, how often can you rotate and rotate and rotate? And yeah. then you have to consider the type of player that those individuals are. Yeah. Those are team guys, not me guys. Those players came here with a willingness to compete. Those players understand when they come here, they are going to compete for time. They're not going to be given anything. And I do think it takes a special athlete, it takes a special player to understand that part of it too and not be some malcontent yeah. and not yell at the coaches and not demand this, demand that. The coach is literally telling you, 
I'm open, guys. You sort it out. I'm not going to sort anything out. You sort it out. And I think it takes a special player to do that. The thing I love about it is it's led by a special guy, and that guy is Aaron Glenn. Aaron Glenn, we saw what he was able to do in his NFL career. He was a tremendous player. He was a Pro Bowl type player. But he's a guy that sold out for the team. Sold out consistently for his team, made sure his team had everything they needed out of him. And I think that's what the guys, that's the energy that these players pick up on. The good thing that's going to happen, though, Ryan and Money, right now, yeah, you got a bunch of guys that are, you know, for the team and for the team. And, you know, it's the collective. It's whatever I can do. I want to get on the field wherever way you need me to be so that I can make the play for this defense or this offense. But stars are going to start to rise to the forefront. You're going to start. You need stars to win in this league. And what I mean by that, you got to have that star attitude. You got to have that ego a little bit. I don't care if you're a team guy. You still got to have that confidence where you're like, shoot, they give me the ball. I know what's on the popping. Or put me in the game. Who, who Who's balling on Who's balling on offense? What wide receiver? Put me on him. I got something for him this week. Much like you saw um, uh, Stephon Gilmore do to A.J. Brown last year. You got to have guys that had that confidence. And out of this competition – in the spring, in the summer, and eventually the fall, you'll start to see what guys ascend to the top of that list. It's great to have team guys. It's great to have everybody play together. But eventually somebody has to take over. Much like Amon Ross St. Brown did. You realize that what? He's not just a wide receiver on the team. He's a superstar. I think that's what's going to happen in the secondary, in his defense. Outside of Aiden Hutchinson, you'll start to see a couple superstars emerge from this team. Hey, I was a big fan last year of CJ GJ. They went out and got him. And he got hurt in game two. And you really don't know what he could have brought to this team. He did bring a swagger to this team. It kind of wore thin at the end of the year, especially in the NFC Championship game, when he got up on the, uh, on the bench and started, you know, raking with the uh, 49er fans. But that all said, he is gone. They brought a guy in from the Oakland Raiders, from the uh, Vegas Raiders. The Amique little guy. Robertson. His name is Amik Robertson. I want to tell you about this guy. This guy has got, like, he's got a heart of a lion. Have you seen... Any video on this guy, any tape on this guy, you're going to be, he's going to be a favorite of the Lions. And I'm going to tell you right now, he is going to start. Here's Dan Campbell on Amik Robertson. You just said, I don't care if he's inside or outside, the guy competes. I mean, he is a feisty, competitive, challenging corner who has versatility to play in and out. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's always going to appeal to us. You know, the more uh, flexibility you have, in and out is is always gonna because you can do more jobs right it's easier to get you to the game um but but the first thing that pops off the tape is is how much he challenges and competes i mean there, there was no denying that so we knew he'd fit right in here with us this guy is something man he sticks up for the team right yeah name a guy uh on any of your teams that you even back in michigan all the way through the pros you have that one guy that would go and stick up like what Caitlin Clark needs yeah. on her team. This guy is that guy. You know, it's funny. And as you were talking about uh, CJ GJ, CJ GJ last year, he was came in. Maz, he was your guy. He was the guy you wanted free agency. We don't know what he could have been because of injuries and because of how when he came back, how it played out. But you always take a little bit from certain individuals or a, a certain thing. When you have a failed relationship, you, you don't look at everything that failed in the relationship. What worked in the relationship? Yeah. Let me add this to Those my always next. always good times. 100%. Let me add this to the next yeah. relationship. And maybe let me not add this other stuff. I think what you saw at CJ GJ was that swag, that energy, having Love each it. other's back, not backing down from Correct. anybody. These are good things for the Lions to hold on to on that defense. And I think Amik Robinson coming on. You, when he got picked up, like I started watching some film because you know, he was a yeah. short guy. You start watching film. He backs up this stuff that he talks he about. He big. is in every play. He plays bigger than he is. He has no fear. And I think that's what CJ GJ had. Now, I'm not saying he's a replacement for CJ GJ, yeah. but in the fact that he has no fear, people gravitate towards certain energy. And you start adding it into your repertoire and what you are. You see guys are fearless that are next to you. Well, what am I? What am I scared of? What, 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 am I, what, am I, what am I overly thinking? I need to be fearless, like this guy is. When you're fearless, it doesn't say you don't make mistakes, but you don't make many of them because you come back again and again and again. You deal with adversity. Look at the Legion of Boom that you played with. Now they the were at, at, Earl Thomas, and I, you got Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman made Cam, his name Cam Chancellor. Yeah, they, Bobby Wagner in your face, it, in your face. But you know what? The thing that I see in them, and I see in the Lions. Now I want to see this fully in the secondary is they held each other accountable. Mm. They could talk to each other a certain type of way, and it wasn't, oh, there's beef between Earl and Richard Sherman. There were plenty of arguments between Earl and Richard Sherman. 
Cam Chancellor, they got into it. They will hold each other accountable, though. Maxwell, the DB on the other side, or Jeremy Ivey on the other side. Hold each other accountable. Make sure you're getting the best out of each other. When you do that, you play to the best of your ability. And I think that's what a guy like Amik Robertson can bring to the table is, look, I'm going to hold you accountable, much like we thought CJ GJ would be. Mentioned seven defensive backs. Uh, a couple of guys in the chat said, what about Vildor and I Emmanuel Mosley? I love Vildor and but Mosley. But again, you, you know, <laughs> there's nine guys right there, which I think if you if you would have had four of them, you'd feel like you were in a good spot. You got nine. Yeah. Oh man! If, if, pick any 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 four of those nine guys, and any Lions fan would say we're in a decent spot back there. But you got nine of those players. Whew. That's pretty darn good. That's a strength of this team, and you can never have enough defensive backs. It's amazing. I mean, they, they, where they've come from, it's remarkable. They yeah. come from, unfortunately, the, a failed number one pick out of Ohio State that they were putting the, wor- the weight of the world on his shoulders. And yeah. again, though, this is now up to Aaron Glenn and yeah. Dan Campbell and them to figure out you know, how to use these guys, how to best utilize Who works these best guys. Together. And one of the things about that Dan Campbell soundbite, I'm not sure anybody caught this, but Dan Campbell was like, yeah, I talked to AG about that a few days ago. Yeah. And I talked to Ben every night. Exactly. Oh, I <laughs> thought that. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm it's an like when you tell guy, me, right? It's like when you guys send me something to put on the rundown, it's already on the rundown. <laughs> They see the same thing. And I don't. Ryan's do like, "Hey, I sent you that." I'm like, "Yeah, it's been on for two days. It's been on the rundown." I send you stuff off of Instagram. Yeah, that's so, a problem. So, I, so I know yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not double sending things. That's all. But, but that's how it is, though. You, you love your side of the ball. Like, look, when I was in New England, I'm not New England. I never was there. When I was with New York with the Jets. Rex never came to the offensive meetings. I'm not sure Rex and, and Brian Schottenheimer even talked that much, but Rex was always next to Mike Pett, and those guys were like this because Rex is a defensive guy. That's how NFL coaches are, man. Like They, they hire the one. So funny. They, they're like, look, if I'm an offensive guy, look, I'm going to hire a defensive guy that I trust. Hey, look, go do your thing. And that's what he did in Aaron Glenn. Aaron Glenn is a former teammate. He's also a brother in arms in the NFL. So he trusts him, and he lets him do his thing. And, you know, how far – ahead the Detroit Lions are right now not only with their head coach there's a there's a bunch of teams that have the same head coach this team virtually has the same exact coaching staff for four years now virtually not not really but they they do have the same coordinators for years All of them. now um you know outside of uh, Anthony Lynn and Aubrey Pleasant you know and Aubrey Pleasant um, this is a coaching staff. That, oh, and Dre Bly last year. Yeah, I mean, there's, there have there been additions. Right. But what I'm saying is the majority of these coaches have been together uh, for this is their fourth year. And now you're adding Terrell Williams in. Absolutely. The right-hand man of Mike Vrabel all those years and Dan Campbell's friend. He's going to coach that D-line. Look out, man. Just how far ahead you can be as an organization on the field when you have this – amount of consistency off of it. Yeah, you know, and don't sleep on who they brought in the DB. They brought in Deshae Towns and the guy that played for years in this league, high at a high level for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, I forgot Look, about that. Sometimes you have to vet the process, and the DB position is one of those positions that it seems like each year we're having to bring a different ga- a different guy in and figure it out. But what has Dan Campbell done? He's brought a different guy in to figure it out. This time they got Deshae Towns, and I know, I know, I've known him since the Jerome Bettis camp. Back in the day, Ryan and Monty, when he used to do it in uh, the early 90s here in Detroit at Highland Park. So, the Shades guy I know personally, but on the field, he was that deal as well. So, I'm excited to see what this secondary could be under new leadership and how they responded to Shades Towns in some way. What a, what, a, what a heavy resume. Can we play already? <laughs> hey, let's talk a little Lions now if we oh, could. Oh, yeah. He is the senior writer and insider for DetroitLions.com, Tim Twentyman. How you doing, Tim? Hey, Tim. Good. How are you guys doing? Doing fantastic today, bud. Uh, hey, before we get into what's happening on the field, what in the world happened off of it? Uh, lines get docked <laughs> or something like that in OTA day? What'd they do? What'd they do? Yeah, they got docked in OTA day. You know, the, the rules in the off season. obviously it's, it's no pads. You know, guys are running around in shorts and a helmet. And, you know, the NFL Players Association takes pretty seriously periods that they deem maybe a little bit too much contact happen. Um, and so I think that's kind of just what happened. The Lions got dinged with having a little bit too much contact in a non-padded practice. And, um, so they got one OTA day taken away. Now, look, the vets are already gone. 
Um, they left after um, – uh, a mandatory mini camp last week. So it was really just going to be some young players, maybe a couple of vets that stuck around rookies going through really light um, kind of short practices. So they'll, they'll, you know, still have a couple of those this week. Um, they'll have one open to us, the media tomorrow, but that's, I think essentially what happened, maybe just a little bit too much contact that then, that then is allowed here in the off season. You, you know, I know you can't really take a lot from what happens at minicamp, but one of the things that, that I've always appreciated about this Dan Campbell, Brad Holmes-led team is you look up at Sports Center, you, you, you look up uh, at any one of the sports channels that are talking about the NFL, there's no drama. There's no holdouts. Nobody's waiting on a contract. Nobody's a malcontent. And I do think, Tim, that goes a long way in the success of an organization. Can you just speak to – how smooth, knock on wood, everything has run so far up to this offseason, including the, the, the re-signing of uh, the, the four Lions, really, yep. really four Lions, uh, they got their money and in, in deservedly so. Yeah, that was huge, you know, to re-sign Jared Goff, to, to uh, you know sign a contract extension with Peneso and Amon Ross St. Brown. That, that's your core. Yep. That's, that's the key pieces to your football team. And so, you know, what I think that says, not only – to your point about limiting drama and holdouts and everything else that comes with, you know, guys wanting a new contract. But I think that those are your best players. Those are the guys that come to work, put their head down, do the work and have performed on the field. And what that does, I think it reverberates, reverberates, excuse me, throughout the locker room. I think it shows that this is an organization willing that if you come in, if you do your part, you put in the work and you become a really good player you'll make money. This team will sign you and they'll sign you to record deals. Um, and so, you know, I, I, not only does it limit just the, the hassle of the off season of all the contract talks and guys holding out and everything else, but I think it just shows that, um, you know, this is a, a team that's willing to pay good young players who are part of this core. And, and I think, you know, that that's not only going to be felt to the guys on this roster, but I think that's going to be felt to free agents too. Um, this wanting to be a place to play, this being a place that will pay guys um, and take care of them. And so it, not only to what you talked about, but I think it has larger ramifications as well. Hey, Tim, uh, talk a little bit about uh, a guy that everyone's talking about, and that's Jamison Williams right now. And it looks like he's really, I don't know, this is his coming out party is the way I want to describe it. What would you say about him? Yeah, you know, he's looking in the spring. You know, he's going to be that number two guy. Um, Josh Reynolds is gone, and so, you know, there's 64 targets um, that need to go somewhere else, and I think J-Mo's going to see a lot of them. You know, really, his rookie season was a redshirt year, you know, with the knee injury and everything else, and then obviously had the hamstring injury in camp last year, was suspended the first, you know, month of the season, but he really came on strong at the end of last year, and I, I kind of view this as, like, that second season, right, where young yep. players usually take that biggest step from year one to year two, like that's this year for J-Mo. You know, he's played in a, in a lot of football games. Now, he's had um, some big moments. You look at San Francisco last year, and he's going to get an opportunity. And I think he's not just the guy that runs, you know, really fast deep anymore. I think he's really developed the whole route tree. We saw that this spring. Um, uh, Jared really feels comfortable with him. He made a lot of, you know, some tough catches over the middle, one over the shoulder along the sideline. Um, he's going to be used in a lot of different ways, and, and uh, this is certainly an opportunity for him to have a really big season as, as really the number two wide receiver in that room. And you kind of just talked about it, Tim, but just how big is that for this young man to be part of the entire offseason operation? Like, there, there's no missed time. There's no weeks off. There's no little injury. There's no suspension. There's no nothing. He can participate fully in an off season. I have to imagine that helps him along as well. Yeah, it's time on task and it's chemistry with your quarterback. That's what you get. You know, and Jared talked about this a little bit. He's so fast and he's so quick out of his breaks that he had never played with a player like that. That you, you, you have to throw it a little bit different to him because he's so fast. I mean, you can put, you know, on one hand, the guys that are in this league that are as fast as James Williams. And so it's a little bit different. So just that time on task, those practice reps, that time with your quarterback. When's he going to come out of this break? Where do I have to put this? It's those little things that, that you build over time, and that's been so important with Jameson this offseason. He was at every practice. He had all those reps, and I would expect him to have a really big season. Tim, are you comfortable? Uh, let's just put, put, make you a Lion fan for a second. Are you comfortable with the receivers that they have now? Obviously, Saint and J-Mo side. You got Donovan Peoples-Jones. 
Uh, and Khalif. and you got Khalif Raymond, who I know that Dan Campbell loves. Did, are they still shy one guy? You know, I think how I look at it when I, I you know, and I like Khalif Raymond. I, that's a guy that is very underrated um, and, and a guy, again, that Jared trusts. And Donovan Peoples-Jones has had experience, has made plays in this league. Well, how I view it is, I look at it, well, what happens if, if something happens to St. Brown? What, right. what happens if you're without St. Brown for a month? Then now what does that wide receiver room look like? And I, and I think maybe you could use, you know, one more kind of veteran guy who's done it. Wouldn't be surprised if, if someone is added before a training camp starts. But you also have to think about this offense as a whole. And you've got to, you, you've got to lump Sam Laporta into that, that mix as well. That's 121 targets yeah. last year. Brock Wright. You know, you yeah, Brock Ray, uh, even a, a Jameer Gibbs, who had 52 right. catches and 71 targets last year. They talked last week about expanding his role, oh, maybe getting yeah. him in the slot a little bit, doing more than just being a dump-off guy. Let's see if we can get him in space down the field, intermediate parts of the field. So you have to factor in him as well. So if you look at the receiver room as a whole, yeah, maybe they could stand to add another guy. But if you then look at Gibbs and Laporta and some of the other weapons that they have, I think pass catchers at a whole – they're in a pretty good spot as long as they don't suffer any injuries. I'll tell you, man. I'm a uh, give me Jameer Gibbs. I swear to you, I mean this. I would take him over any running back in the NFL right now. From what I saw from him last year, I think the sky's the limit for this guy. And I, you know, to hear Lewis Riddick speak about him tells me I'm right. Yeah, he's a really good player. He's really explosive, and that was as a rookie, you know. Exactly. And so he's so much more comfortable now. And you know, if he becomes a big part of the pass game, I think. Um, they are very much going to use him like San Francisco uses Christian McCaffrey being very much a part of the passing game. I mentioned it. He had, I think, 52 catches, 71 targets. I wouldn't be surprised if he's up over 75-plus catches and rushes for 1,000 yards. I think he's going to have you know, that kind of impact. Um, he is one of those, you know, dynamic players under 25. You know, PFF did that, Amazing. does that uh, list every year of, of the, yeah. you know, the top players under 25. The Lions had 20% of that list, five <laughs> guys on that list, and he's one of them. So it's just, it, it, it certainly set up for, six, uh, excuse me, it's certainly set up for sustained success, and he's part of that. Talking to Tim Twentyman, DetroitLions.com, senior writer, insider. Uh, check him out there on that platform. Tim, I wanted to ask you, too, uh, obviously the, the veterans are gone and, and they'll come back for, for training camp next month at the end of next month, but what about the rookies? And, and how quickly do these rookies assimilate to what the Lions want them to do to the NFL game? I mean, I, I, I know it's mini camp, and they're not out there hitting. Did the coaching staff single out anybody is, is coming along nicely, or is that all just too premature? No, Terry and Arnold certainly is one of those guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was starting in minicamp opposite um, Carlton Davis um, at you know with the first team. And look, he ended a drill with an interception off Jared Goff on the first day of minicamp. Um, you know, he's been um, he's been really really good. You know, he got his hands on some other footballs. He certainly looks like he belongs. You know, he didn't look out of place, and that's the biggest thing when I look at the spring. And you mentioned it without pads and everything else. Just does a guy fit? He doesn't make mistakes. Um, he doesn't slow down the operation, and he makes plays. And Terrian did that. I think, you know, they're going to be a little bit slower with with Enos Rakestraw. Um, they got him playing inside. That's obviously a spot where Brian Branch is at right now. And then, you know, some of the other guys, I think you know, Sione Vaki has a chance to, you know, be a, a core special teams guy, maybe get in a little bit on offense. He showed great hands. And then, um, you know, the, the defensive tackle out of LSU is going to be, you know, part of that rotation, I think, up front to – a little bit different size, Wingo, um, you know, quick first step. It'll be interesting to see him with pads um, because he offers something a little bit unique there. But when you look at the rookies, I think when you're talking about immediate impact and guys that can uh, make plays right away, Terry Arnold comes to mind. I wouldn't be surprised if he's starting opposite Carl Davis week one against the Rams. Hey, Tim, this is a KG on Sounds. Big fan of your work, by the way. Um, and I saw some of the things you wrote on Jack Campbell. This is a player that a lot of people – are expecting to take a next step. It looks like he's worked on some things in the coverage part of his game. How does Jack Campbell look, and what can we expect um, him to look like in the season? Yeah, you know, he's he's all about ball. That's the thing when I when I when I see Jack Campbell, when I talk to Jack Campbell, when I talk to others about Jack Campbell, is he, the Lions have no worry about him because he is one hundred percent committed to football. He's all about ball, and he got an off season now to. You know, not have to deal with the underwear Olympics and the 
pre-draft process and everything else. He could just focus on football and focus on his body and focus on the things that he needs to improve on. And, you know, he's going to be, I think that guy right there, he's going to be that Mike guy. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if it's him and, and Alex have 100 tackles. And the biggest part for him is he's got to improve the coverage part, like you talked about. I thought it was a, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought it was a great time. He had two interceptions in minicamp. Uh, one, he, he baited golf into a throw and stepped right in front of it. It was a really nice play by him. So if he can get better in that aspect of it, um, then you play more third down. Then you play more third and longs. Then you have some more opportunities to make big plays, right? Sacks and interceptions and some of the big numbers and, and big plays that come with playing linebacker position. But yeah, you know, like he is he is going to be just fine. Um, he's a guy that, that, that this organization doesn't worry about. He does all the things right. He works. And, you know, he's going to step into that role, and I think he's going to be a linebacker for 10 years and a guy that, mm-hmm. you know, annually, annually gets about 100 tackles a year. Hey, Timmy, how about uh, Amik Robertson? What have you seen out of him? This is a guy I think that people are sleeping on. I, I believe that he's going to be a starter on this team. Yeah, he was one of my five guys that impressed me in me camp. Um, you know, he really gets his hands on footballs and competes. You know, a guy's only five foot eight, but yeah. you would, ne- you know, watching him and talking to him, you'd, 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 you'd never know it. Watch him on a football field. Um, I think one of the, 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 the things he offers is um, obviously he can play inside, can play the nickel, but really he played his best ball in Las Vegas last year when he had to play outside, um, play 10 games out there and played really, really well. And so here's a guy that gives you a little bit of versatility. Um, he can play inside. You get an injury outside, he can pop out there too. You know, he can play a really good nickel, so maybe that gives you some leeway with Brian Branch. Maybe he plays a little bit of safety um, in some packages and um, does some of those things. So, you know, he's he's he, he's tough. Um, he plays much bigger than his size. He really fits what, what Dan Campbell and Aaron Glenn want on defense, a really physical cornerback who doesn't mind coming up and hit you despite the size, and also gives you some versatility to play inside and outside. Hey, Tim, I wanted to ask you, last week we were just talking about the Lions, and, uh, you know, there were a couple of media availability sessions for Dan Campbell, and I just I, – I keep looking at this guy, and I'm like, what's his biggest problem? What's his biggest problem? What's his biggest problem going to be uh, this year? Or what's his biggest challenge? And the thing that I came up with, I want to see what you think about it, is I think his biggest challenge this year – will be to get to these guys or keep these guys going day by day, week by week, and not looking ahead. Um, w- when you haven't won a division championship, when you haven't won a playoff game, when you haven't won a home playoff game, when you haven't done these things, it's a lot easier to stay on task. But when you have done those things, I feel like human nature would be to just look past all that stuff, automatically feel like that is where you will be be next year and the year after that and kind of let things slip through your fingers a little bit in terms of attention to detail and stuff like that now I don't I I don't feel like that'll happen with this group but if there is some area that I think is a level of concern to me it's just not looking ahead just win yeah. the, win the practice win the day yeah yeah, you know, don't assume you're going to be back, right? I mean, I'm sure Dan Marino thought that he would play in a Super Bowl again after getting there. What was his rookie year or second year? <laughs> his rookie year, you know? yeah, right? Yeah, his rookie year and was never back. And I think that's kind of, um, you know, been one, been one of, of Dan's talking points this year. Is just don't, don't assume we'll be back. You know, you have to put in the work. You have to do the little things. Like you talked about, every day of practice, we have to get a little bit better. What's the – the saying, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Yep. And those have been the messages here. It's don't ever assume anything. Um, you have to earn it just like you did last year. Um, do we feel good about our chances? Is this the best roster we've had in a long time? Sure. Yes, it is. Um, but you still have to go out there and perform, um, do the little things right. And I would be very, very surprised if this team didn't with how close they got last year and how they felt that they gave that game away oh. and didn't get an opportunity to finish it. I think this is a very hungry group, despite the you know first division title in 30 years and the first playoff win in 32 years and all the things that they accomplished last year. They felt that they had a Super Bowl winning team and they let it slip through their hands and they are determined not to let that happen again. I hope you're right, man. Hey, I can't let you go without asking about the kicking game. And I hear, <laughs> I hear good things about James Turner from Michigan. I know money badgers there. Uh, there's a guy who kicked for the Panthers, of course, and Jake Bates. What's the kicking game looking like going forward? What's your take on that? 
Yeah, Turner actually looked, looked really good. He didn't miss a kick um, in minicamp. And, you know, booted one. I was standing under the goalpost. I think he was like 55 yards, and it went way over my head. It would have been good from 65. So he's got a strong leg. Um, can he do it consistently? Can you count on him for the 48, 40, you know, 49, 44 yarders that you have to be money on in this league? That will be interesting come training camp. Um, we talked to Dave Fipp. He said Michael Badgett really worked hard to improve his leg strength a little bit. We saw in the first couple OTAs, he had a 60 yarder. And so there's a little bit of leg there. So it, it'll be a good competition. I think there's going to be a lot of teams that want to sign bait um, just to get him in the camp and, and see what they can do. We'll see if the Lions are, are, are part of that. But, but look, Badgley was really good at the end of the year. He was perfect in the playoffs, including a 54 yarder to, to help beat the Rams. So I think either way they go, they're going to feel pretty good. Um, about the fact that they've got, uh, you know, a guy that they can trust to make some kicks. And um, either way, Dan's going to go for a lot on fourth down anyway. So uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> That's a fact, man. <laughs> hey, uh, you're, you're, you're working alone there right now. Unless you're going to hire somebody pretty soon, our, our own Mike O'Hara has, uh, has left the building. I mean, nobody yeah, better than 40, Mo. Wait, what what, what was it? Years. Yeah, I mean, I know the guy real well. He's a friend of mine. What was it like working with him and learning under him? It was great. You know, I, I had the benefit of doing it at the Detroit News. I worked for the Detroit News for yep. eight years before I took this job. And obviously, Mike was a longtime columnist at the news, too, before he came here. So pretty much my whole professional year, I've, I've you know, been able to work with and learn from a guy who's been doing it, you know, for 46 years, cover to be there's Like you said, he's one of the best in the business. And so I consider myself very, very fortunate to have been able to work with and learn from Mr. Michael Hara. And it'll be sad to see him go, but I'm sure he'll pop in from time to time at, at some Lions games and, and grace us all with his story. Of course. Oh, yeah. He, you will know gra- he will grace us for sure. Hey, Tim, thanks so much for spending some time with Thank us on you, a Tim. Monday. Really appreciate your insights. And uh, we enjoy you on DetroitLions.com. And we invite everybody right now listening or watching to uh, watching us to uh, head on over to DetroitLions.com. Great content on that platform. Thanks so much, Tim. See you, Timmy. Yeah, appreciate it. Anytime, guys. You appreciate got you, it. Man. Uh, the great Tim Twentyman. Lions training camp uh, dates are out, and you can go to DetroitLions.com for training camp tickets. Tickets are going to be available on the training camp website uh, July 9th for season ticket holders. For the general public, they'll start on July 16th. There you see the dates pretty much from the 27th of July through August 14th. um, That is the training camp schedule, and... Uh, on July 27th, it is their first day. Lions oh, back together hard. weekend, open to Lions loyal members only. So uh, that is a Lions loyal members only day. On August 2nd, Lions loyal members, and on August 12th, Lions loyal members. But everything else is open to the public. Uh, but you will need tickets. The space is limited, uh, so you'll have to go to DetroitLions.com and click on uh, the training camp tickets. Again, uh, for the general public, if you are not a season ticket holder, you could start getting those tickets July 16th. Um, I think training camp is a great time to to go out to camp. You see a lot of things that you wouldn't normally see. The access you have to the players, uh, you wouldn't normally have that access. I am very excited to watch Detroit Lions football this year. I mean, I think last year leading up to Bray, the Kansas City game, that was a special time. They were coming off an 8-2 and two finish, a win over the Packers at Lambeau the previous year. There were a lot of expectations for this team, but you um, really weren't sure what they were going to be because it was, yeah, that was last year's finish, and you hoped they were going to be good this year. You hoped everybody was going to take a step. They did. They ultimately did things they hadn't done in decades uh, last year. And now you're looking for more this year. Um, And it starts with training camp. And Braylon Edwards, I will tell you that this is the year that I think so many of us point to. Are you going to have a a downturn? Are you going to revert back to uh, some of the other things? Heaven forbid, have two good years in a row. Or are you really turning this thing around, which most of us believe? Um, And... This is uh, a window into a Super Bowl period. This is your yeah. Super Bowl window. It is right now. Yeah, training camps are always fun. I'm, I'm going to get into that, but just getting back to training camp is what 
Training camps are fun because you get a chance to see players play that you don't necessarily get to see during the season or that you're wondering about. You get to see the second team and the third team. This year, it'd be fun to watch Jamison Williams. Seems like he's coming to his own. It'd be fun to watch. Where is the secondary at? That's, I think that's going to be where a lot of people's eyes are. Kirby Joseph, will he take that step? The guys they drafted, Ernest Rakestraw, Terry and Arnold, the guys they brought in, Amik Roberts, as well as Carlton Davis II. So I think that's where a lot of eyes will go. But training camp is that time where you can see a, uh, excuse me, what's the quarterback name? Hendon Hooker. You can see him because right now, who knows what Hendon Hooker looks like. So that'll be fun to see. And just the guys and the energy and the momentum. And this is, like you said, this is where it starts. Getting to that trajectory. 313 and 1 to 9 and 8 to 12 and 5. They've taken the steps each year and got better and better and better. Now, this year may not be 13. It may not be 14. It may not be more wins. But this year is a team, I think they're more complete as a team. So I can't wait to see. And this is the first year I actually wouldn't mind going to a training camp. You know, having played football, a lot of times, you know, these things, you kind of, I don't feel like going to training camp. I'm ready for the season. But watching the Lions where everybody's excited, Jared Goff got paid. Amon Ross St. Brown got paid. Panay Sewell got played. It seems as though they've put the pieces in positions where they were bad last year, the defensive line, the secondary. It'll be fun to watch those battles because now the Lions have a really good team. It's fun to watch those guys battle. When you're back watching Calvin Johnson go against whoever the heck the secondary was back in the day, it's not a good, uh, it's not a good back and forth. Now, team's elite, so it'll be fun to watch the ones versus the ones, the twos versus the twos. So I might, I might have to get out there one of those days, Ryan. Hey, it's also fun to have uh, the other teams come in and have those joint practices. This is true. What do they get with the Giants? Uh, there's another team that get with Jags. Well. Giants they got with last year. Jets. Not the Jets. Awesome. They got with Indianapolis last year. Uh, two years Frank ago, Wright. Indianapolis. Yeah. I'm just trying to think. I think maybe they get with the Colts again this year. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know, know who they. They usually get with whoever they're playing in the preseason. Oh yeah, the That's, Giants are one. Yeah, um, Kansas City. Jesus is another, yeah. but yeah. I don't think they get. I don't think they're going to be. I, I don't know. I haven't seen that, that schedule. But that's out. always that's always the fun thing to do. Giants, it, Chiefs, and Steelers. What was that? Steelers. Giants, Steelers, Chiefs, and Steelers. Yeah, yeah, Giants, Chiefs, and Steelers. So yeah. that's a great thing to do, and uh, other teams are doing that as well. It's it's become more of the norm now in uh, I can training tell camp. Running things. It's it's I'm becoming more of the norm. Sorry, sorry. I was looking up information. I'm sorry. I know. Oh, the information. The information highway. Uh, it's always something. <laughs> Love you, Pete. Love you too, bro. And you, you forgot too. what you were saying. I, I, I lost, lost my train of thought. thought. <laughs> lost my train of thought. Well, you know, it, we're one, we're one month and two days away yeah. from training camp. So right now we are in the what? What do, what do you want to call this this period? Purgatory. We're in purgatory. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We're in purgatory. Sports talk purgatory. So anything you want to talk about, hey, let us know, and we will tackle it for you. But, yeah, who who isn't looking forward to, to seeing the, the Honolulu Blue get back at it again? I think everybody. And, Braley, you brought up word competition. When, when's the last time that you had legitimate competition at spots over, you know, uh, competition at safety, competition at corner, competition yeah. at defensive line, competition at edge, 2013. competition at, at linebacker. And it's not just competition because you're not good enough and we're trying to find the best of the worst player to uh, These are players. sum up. These are talented starters yeah. and could be starters on many rosters in the league. And... um a lot of guys chose to come here to compete. And I think that's the that's the consensus interview that you see when guys come to the Lions. You know, I still can go back to last year. And, I, and guys this year said the same thing. DJ Reader was super excited about it. Taron Arnold told you he slept in his hat after the draft, as did Ennis Rakestraw. But I think we started seeing that last year. David Montgomery, when he got signed, when he first came here, he said, look, I don't care. I'm just excited to be here, excited to get in the backfield. I don't care what I need to do. If I need to get the water, if I need to catch passes, I'm just excited to be on this team. You saw CJ, uh, uh, excuse me, Cam Sutton last year. Similar conversation when he got interviewed about joining, and then CJ Gardner-Johnson, the same thing. This is a destination city. This is a destination team nowadays. People are excited to play for the Lions. They're excited to get an opportunity to be coached by Dan Campbell and play with this squad, man, that has built it from the ground up. You're talking about ground up. That's exactly what Brown Holmes and Dan Campbell have done. So I'm excited to see these guys, man. And, and it also seems like they get the guys that, like Amit Robinson, he's coming in. He's, he's got a chip on his shoulder. He's got an axe to grind. He's a vocal guy, KG. So excited to see him. I'm, I actually want to see what is Amit Robinson about. I think it's, enough hype has been around him. He's got me interested. He got me intrigued. Yeah, and you just want to see this whole team and all the improvements they've made 
all together, man. They yeah. really attacked what we thought was a weakness uh, this past offseason. So you just you really want to see it, man. I don't think I've ever seen a Lions team to where they had legitimate Super Bowl expectations. Last year they had expectations, but that was just a division. That was just get to the playoffs and, and hopefully win. Win a game. Right? Home, play, exactly. home yeah. playoff game. This year is totally different, and going forward, this needs to be the norm. Lions fans need to get adjusted to that. The next three to four years, this is their window, and Super Bowl or bust is actually true. I almost forgot. I think the people that I got, I think the player that people are most excited to see during training camp, it's got to be Sione Vaki. That's the guy Brad Holmes is excited about. That's the Swiss Army knife, as he's been dubbed, mm -hmm. that everybody's talking about. I can't wait to see how they use him because whether it's special teams, offense, defense, that new uh, uh, kickoff return situation they have. Yeah. He's going to be Vaki, the steal of the draft. Sione Vaki, I, you, imagine, you, you might be on something so with too. that. Yep. You might be on to something with that. You know, one of the things, too, and, and KG, you brought this up about um, – just playing the games and, and this year's expectations. I was listening to an interview with an Ottawa player. I think it was dry saddle actually um, talking about his disappointment of losing the Stanley cup final game seven of the Stanley cup final. And one of the things he was talking about was how difficult it is now to be so close from a Stanley cup. And I'm comparing this to the lions, be so close to the super bowl. You could taste yeah. it mm. and then have to go back to training camp. Start again. Have to go back to all the off season workouts. Go through eighty two regular season games again, and then go through each round of the playoffs, Jeez. only to have the opportunity to get back where you were right now. Ugh. And I thought about the Lions as just part of this conversation, because you know all those. Things, I felt like I appreciated the journey last year way more than I think I'll appreciate the journey this year. Correct. And I'm already starting to kind of try to slow myself down about it because I really just want to project forward and automatically get back to that NFC championship game. And even if they do, okay, even if they do get to the NFC championship game, which I fully expect them to do, by the way, I'm not sure I will enjoy each week <laughs> as I enjoyed yeah. each week last year. Mm -hmm. It was just a different level of expectation. And again, anything is new is way more fun than when it's old, right? I mean, right. That was our first winning season right. since since the, yeah. the Indomitian Sioux right. years. I mean, think about the the first Stanley Cup in '97 was better than the third one in '02. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'm just being honest. Fact. The divisional series against the Yankees in 06 was better than the divisional series against the Yankees in 12. Yep. Yeah. You know, I mean, again, in that experience, I feel like... We got to meet Verlander and Zumaya the first time. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You got to meet Jim Leland, yeah. really. Right. Um, it really is special when you first get there. Exactly. And, yeah. I, and I think the Super Bowl will be special when you get there. But it's a long road to get there. And I guess what I'm trying to say is there's part of me that because the ex expectations are so elevated, I'm not going to enjoy each week of the season as much as I enjoyed it last year because of how new that felt. In 2009, I got traded to the Jets. I mean, I've said it a million times on the show, but I guess I always have to preface it. Got traded to the Jets. That ride, Ryan and mine, that first time around when we got to the AFC Championship, it was just a fun ride because we didn't know what was going on. Shoot, we thought with three, four games left in the season that we were out of it. Insert, well, you guys still have a chance. Well, it's a slim chance. Well, you beat this team, you get in, lost to that team. Now, you still got a chance, ended up getting in, so we beat the Cincinnati Bengals. We got in. We go to Cincinnati first round, Maz. We beat Cincinnati in Cincinnati. Then we go to San Diego. Chargers. We have no have no business beating the Chargers. It was a fun season. We snuck in the playoffs. We got a playoff win. Guess what? Well, we went out there and beat the San Diego Chargers as well. And at halftime of the AFC Championship, we're beating the Colts in Indy. We end up losing that game. I say that to say this. That was fun. We just enjoyed the ride. I think our family enjoyed the ride. The fans enjoyed the ride. Year two, 2010, now we're picked to win the division. Now the pressure's on. Now we're on hard knocks. Every week was pressure. Every week we couldn't enjoy. We're trying to see what could our seating be. I think that's what happens once you get good. What's the seating be? Well, we need to be home field advantage. So we got it this. Well, we lost to the Patriots. So doesn't like we'll have the home field advantage. But that one was more. Um, I, it, 
mind boggling, if you will, or it just was a lot of driving forces, but it wasn't as fun. Still got there, still got back, and we lost to the Steelers. But that first one, we just enjoyed the ride. Like, what oh, happens, yeah. happens. You play yeah. who's in front of you, you win, you lose, who happens. That next year, everything was like pressure. Every moment was pressure. Shoot, we lost. What does that do? Dang, we lost this game. Yep. What does that do? Where are the Baltimore Ravens? Where are the Patriots at? Where are the Steelers at? Where are the Colts at? Are we going to have to go to Indy? First year, it was fun. Two years ago when the Lions went 9-8 and eight and got knocked out of the playoffs thanks to the Seahawks uh, losing to the Rams, beating the Rams. And they went out and they still beat Green Bay. Dan Campbell comes back the next year playing basically just like Braylon said. Let's just, let's just roll through. And what happened at the end, NFC Championship, they lose. So Dan Campbell gets out and on the podium, and he's like, we might never get back here. I told the guys, there's a good chance we're not going to get back here. But Dan Campbell, a month ago, rookie camp, and then uh, mini camp, it's Super Bowl or bust. And I don't believe in bust. So it's just how you feel. It's, it's how you feel at the time. To lose, to have your season crash in San Francisco the way it did. <laughs> to have it crash and to be so depressed yeah. because it took you so long to get there. And now you're depressed yeah. and you're saying, well, there's a good chance we're never going to get back here. Then you get a rest time. Get home with your family. You rejuvenate. You make a great draft. You have a great off season of players that you dig. You brought them in. And now it's a new season. It's a new life again. And Dan Campbell's ready for the challenge, right? So right. if you're not going to be as excited, remember Dan Campbell felt like you, but now he's ready to roll, man. And we got yeah, well, you're going to be as excited. You are. I am. Because they're, they're going to be so damn good but, and so impressive that you're going to be like, man, we have a real chance to win a freaking Super Bowl. You definitely will be excited, Ryan. I didn't mean to cut you off, Ryan or KZ, but you'll definitely yeah. be excited. You know why? It's because you trust the people in, or excuse me, you trust the people running the show. You trust Dan Campbell that he's gotten better as a fourth-year head coach. You trust that he'll be a little bit better than he was last year. And last year, he was damn good. Mm -hmm. Damn good to the tune where, where a lot of people thought he should have been coach of the year. You trust Brad Holmes, which means you trust the draft picks. means you trust Taron Arnold. You trust Wake Straw. You're excited to see what Sione Vaki can be or a uh, Manu. Uh, you trust the players. You trust and you, and you know that Amon Ross St. Brown got paid. He deserves to be paid. Jared Goff got paid. He deserves to be paid. Panay Sewell, best tackle right now in the game, in my estimation. So I think you trust the players that they brought in. Trust is why we all have fun watching this season. If there's no trust, if you're like, eh, last year was kind of a fluke, mm -hmm. well, now it's nerve-wracking. Yeah. But I think this team is trusted by fans and uh, analysts like us. Dan Campbell says Super Bowl or bust. I yeah. feel like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't feel like Super Bowl championship or bust, but I feel like Super Bowl or bust. If they go and lose to the Chiefs or lose to the the Ravens, Ravens there's perhaps no Jets. shame in that. Like I think of <laughs> Jets. I, I mean, even Jets the Jets. I feel like even I, Browns. I, I go back to Edmonton, okay? Go back to Edmonton for a second. Yep. There was absolutely no shame in losing that game last night. None. Zero. Literally. Florida won it. And if there's a situation where, you know, the Lions went to the Super Bowl and Lamar Jackson beat them, or if Patrick Mahomes beat them, you can live with yourself. Mm -hmm. But I cannot live with myself if the Lions lose to the 49ers or the Eagles or the Packers or the Rams. Every one of those teams you just talked about, they all got better too. They maybe, did. Maybe not the mm -hmm. Niners, but the other teams. But the Lions did. did as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just think that it is um, it is Super Bowl or bust. This team needs to win the NFC Championship game. Um, and I think if you don't win the NFC Championship game when you're as good as this team is, um, I think that's when people start to chisel away at, at you. Yeah. Like, is Dan Campbell the right guy for the job? Is he making too many in-game mistakes? Um, is Jared can Jared Goff win the big one? I mean, that's when you have all those Correct. types of storylines. That's when they pick at you. If you get to that game and then you get there again or don't get there and falter, they've got to get past that game in order to keep those questions out of the limelight.
Yeah, 100%. I don't think you'll have those questions this year. I think this team is locked and loaded, and I think it's going to be fun. I think it starts soon with training camp. Looks like I got my, my training camp shirt on already. You look like yeah, a player, good. man. Unless you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, you know I'm in shape. Yeah. I might have to go out there and see if I can get a couple plays, but you trust this team, and that trust thing I think is very valuable, and I think that's what the Lions have in us. They've proven that they can be trusted, so they got the trust. Time to talk a little bit sports. We teased it earlier, but Let's a big, it. big, big NBA day. So I think it's best that Anson Wills is in today. Pistons now have. The Pistons now have a head coach. Maz, take it away. How about it, man? It was the first guy they interviewed. It's the first guy we all mentioned on the show. J.D. Yeah, Bickerstaff. We all were scratching our head. Why'd the Cavaliers let him go? I mean, he he took him, he took him far. Yeah. And this yeah. team was ready to get to the next step, I guess. Ownership, the general manager in Cleveland thought, maybe now I want to get somebody else. And I forgot who even Cleveland brought in, to be honest with you. Uh, Kenny Atkinson. Kenny Atkinson from uh, the, the Nets, right? Yep. From the Nets. Or, or from no, the Warriors. Golden State. Golden State. Yeah, from yeah. the Warriors. Formerly. So they, the they bring him in. I don't know what he's got that JB don't have, but I'm happy that the Pistons got this guy. This guy can work with a young team. And now they signed a couple of uh, veterans. We'll get to that in a minute. But the Pistons today are a hell of a lot better than the Pistons before they signed Trajan Langdon. That's a fact. That's yeah, before true. we get to uh, the players that signed, the deals that were signed, because there were some deals, and we will talk about that, some familiar faces uh, coming in as well. First thought when you hear the hire, Anson Wells, J.B. Bickerstaff, you know he's done in Cleveland. First thought, J.B. Bickerstaff, he's uh, the Pistons coach. Go. Feels like when we got rid of Rick Carlisle. Hmm. We get to that point. Indiana feels like they are a team that's ready to ascend and they want to win that Eastern Conference championship. Now, JB's been all over. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's been Track all over. Record, yeah. He's been an interim coach three times. So that tells you that they liked him where he was. They found they had a problem. They didn't have a, an issue putting him in charge. Um, when you look at his tenure at Cleveland, he started off as an assistant head coach. The bubble year he takes over was 11 games as an interim coach. Next season, you know, they're under 500. But the last three seasons, this is a, a, a surging team yeah. above 500. It's been able to figure out how to take their young talent and parlay that into playoff success. This guy gets a raw deal, and the Pistons take advantage of it. This just totally feels like Carlisle leaving the Pistons back in what, 03, 04. Yeah, yeah. hey, the last time, don't forget, the last time they signed a, an ex-Cavaliers head coach, it was Chuck Daly. Yes, it was. Just to let you know. Daddy Chuck Rich. Daly. So let's see. There we go. Let's see, see what JB can do uh, with this uh, Motley crew. Do they have a late beer we can steal too? <laughs> Hopefully he can bring in some of that. Uh, that would be nice. Yes, it would. Da Daddy Rich's skill and what he did with the Pistons in mm. the 80s and the 90s. Mm. First thought is exactly what you said. It talks about the player growth, the player development. I think that's what we've been looking at the Pistons the last seven years or so. Young team, a lot of development and coaches that were not necessarily patient. Look, Dwayne Casey, he didn't come here to coach young guys. He didn't come here to coach babies, and you got to think about that. When he got fired, he did what he could. It's not why he came here. And then you look at Monty Williams throwing a lot of money, throwing a lot of money to come in and coach a team of kids. Basically, it's trying to figure it out. You're trying to figure out these kids, even NBA kids, as we're trying to figure out with Killian Hayes. They work with Jared Allen. They work with Darius Garland there in Cleveland. I like that with Bickerstaff. A lot of hands-on stuff. So you see growth out of those players. That's what you got here. You got Jay Nivey. How are you going to grow him? Kay Cunningham, who we'll talk about in a second. How are you going to grow him as your featured player? How are you going to go Jalen Duran, who missed a lot of time in the last two years? So I think growth, J.B. Bickerstaff, the first thing I saw. And then also, too, they've been above 500 down there in Cleveland the last couple of years. And that is in the East, the same conference that this team is in. So, man, as I look at that and I say yesterday or last week we talked about, it seems like, for as much as he can have because of the owner, and we talk about, you know, arm tell him and whatever, but it seems like Trajan Langdon has a plan. He does. Seems mm -hmm. like he's coming here with a plan, and it seems like now that he's been in front of that microphone, he's been implementing his plan a little bit at a time. I got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable, not confident, yeah. but comfortable right now. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to win 14 games next year. They're no. going to they're gonna win a lot more than that. I don't know how many, yeah. but they're going to be more competitive it's going to be a lot better to watch. And yesterday, early morning, that's when the news broke, and that's when Woj came out on ESPN and told us about J.B. Bickerstaff. He told that the Detroit Pistons are hiring J.B. Bickerstaff as their next head coach. Won 99 games in the last two years in Cleveland, mm -hmm. two trips to the playoffs 
including the Eastern Conference semifinals this year. Uh, Trajan Langdon, the new president with the Pistons, when they dismissed Monty Williams, J.B. Bickerstaff was the first coach they brought in. Uh, he really sold this organization on his ability to not just develop young players, but coach veterans. And listen, Bickerstaff had an outstanding run. You saw the incremental yes, improvement indeed. in Cleveland. Uh, now he becomes the new Pistons head coach. All right, Woj, well, thank you so much. And I think the big thing behind that, man, is you got a coach now, you have a system, and it's all about having a plan. Like, when you have a plan, things get done, and it seems like Tracy Lane has a plan. He hires a coach that's used to developing younger minds, younger players. He understands that. He hires a coach who is a shooting coach. You look at what the New Orleans Pelicans have done over the past four years. They've been in the top ten in the NBA as it relates to three-point shooting. Each of the last four years, this year, this past season, I want to say they finished fourth. So you bring in a guy to help the shooting. You bring in a guy to help the young guys. You're starting to see something transform down there, and also – they bring in some former players. The Detroit Pistons bringing in Tobias Harris for two years, $52 million. KG, I want to start off with you. We should As play Welcome Back, that Welcome Back title song. Welcome, welcome, back, welcome back, Welcome Back, Tobias. Welcome back. Who did that? Was it Mace redid that? Yeah, I when think he, so. Yeah. When he came back from uh, being you like Pastor that. Mason, if you will. Uh, Tobias Harris is a guy that we know. He was here seven years ago, and now he's come back. Not necessarily uh, the same guy he was then, but what do you think about the move to bring Tobias Harris back as a veteran guy yeah. that's been around some deep playoff runs? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't what I wanted initially, but we as Pistons fans have to realize the market was drying up. There's not much you could do. Tobias Harris is a guy that can come in. He can help you with shooting. He can help you a little bit defensively, and he's going to contribute, man. So I think all in all, it's a good signing. He's not making the same money he was making with Philly, so that's a plus as well. Two $26 year. million. Dollars. He uh, getting paid. Yeah, but it's a two-year deal. It's not as bad as 36 okay. or, you know, 40, right. upwards of $40 million. So I would take that all day, man. He's going to come in. He's going to contribute. Maybe after a year, you can come off that contract. It's going to work for right now, man. So it is what it is. <laughs> what, do you expect, what are you expecting out of Tobias Harris? You're talking about a guy at one point when he was here at the Pistons, you kind of saw where he could potentially go. And then yeah. we saw that dream fulfilled. Once he got to the Clippers, he became an all-star caliber player. He goes to the 76ers. It seemed like he's been on a bit of a decline about the last three years. But like KG said, he's a guy that does typically play both ends of the four. And overall for his career, he's a pretty good shooter. What do you think about him now? The, the thing for me that's most important here mm. is this is a guy that not only was willing but wanted to return to Detroit. Yeah. And that's huge right now. You know, people are saying, should we have given Cade the max or not? You can't get a max player in the NBA at all if you're the Detroit Pistons outside of ridiculous trade or the draft. So you have to keep him. Now you look at the tiers of, of the free agents this summer. Couple guys, the cream of the crop, they were gone. We never had a shot. But then that next grouping, yeah. he's firmly in there, Tobias. And the fact that he wanted to come back here when we have a team full of 23 and unders, this guy's not only going to help us with our perimeter shooting, going to help us with some interior and even, and even extended defense, good rebounder, but he is going to come in and not be a guy who's, you know, a, a stranger to Detroit, but he's. He's familiar with the, the administration, familiar with the facility. He's familiar with the city, and he's going to be able to come in here not just as a veteran player, but as a veteran of Detroit and a, a veteran of the Pistons. So he's going to do more than what you just see on the basketball court. I think yeah. that this signing, and when you go a little bit further into bringing back another Michigander and, and Tim Hardaway, you've got two guys that – they're not at the top of their careers. You know, they're, they're on the downslide. They're still very effective players. And what they can bring to the mentality of this young group of, of Pistons, I mean, I can see more than 25 wins with these guys in here. They need yeah. another player. Yeah. But um, this could be even a 30-win team. And I know that's not exciting. Whoa, 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 But it's, whoa, whoa. it's, it's, it's a big I jump. Mean, I really think horse. that these two guys <laughs> alone just change the mentality and the way that this whole team is going to function. I love your optimism, Aston, but slow down over there, sir. Slow down. <laughs> you know, I believe that red, white, and blue, man. Tom Maswell, he brings up a very good point. I know. You, you are Pistons royalty yes, over yes. here, so I have to yes, give yes. you that respect. <laughs> I appreciate uh, it. But he brings up a good point. You know, Monty Williams didn't want to come here. Per se. He was throwing money and yeah. eventually he came here. Players don't typically want to run here. Ryan and Monty talked about it last week. It's an agent driven league. Agents tell their clients where to go. Agents have told their players not to work out for here, et cetera, et cetera. 
But it seems like Bickerstaff wants to be here. It seems like they got the coach right in that sense. Since like Tobias Harris, obviously he got paid here. But at the same time, he wanted to come here. He asked to come here. I think this is what getting off on the right foot looks like for oh, yeah. Trey Laney. Getting players and coaches that want to be here and understand they're coming to Detroit. There's a lot of negative things said about Detroit from the record to how they are in the league and what they love. But it still seems like he's doing it the right way so far. Yeah, I mean, let's yeah. face it. This isn't – It's, tough, going, it's tough sledding. I know, but you're coming here to, to Detroit. Detroit's new, man. Yeah. This ain't old Detroit. Okay. This is, you got a beautiful building to play in. You have a wonderful practice facility, one of the best – in the league. I was down there uh, on a Friday getting an MRI. There you go. There How'd you it go? go? Uh, it, 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 I'm nervous. Okay. But uh, on the 17th, me and Dog can sit there and talk about what happened with the shoulder and maybe some tear in the rotator cuff. I'm All not right, going to claim that. Mm. But uh, From we'll golf? Figure, you know, you're weights, you're golf. Hard. From ball yeah. golf? I lift weights too now. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. Which one was it though? Don't get, did you heard it on the green or did you oh, heard it in the gym? He uh, heard it I've, been compl- I've been complaining about this for the last two months. Yeah, I, I haven't heard it, so I'm some. looking for an answer. The gym the lifting or the links? <laughs> lifting weights. Okay. Lifting Let's weights. Stick to and that's that what he's sticking to. Anyway, stick to that so answer. Beautiful, but beautiful, beautiful <laughs> facility down there in the performance center. Yeah, it's not like you come into a, a yeah. rundown establishment. True. Sure. They're, they're at their yeah. worst right now. You can only go up from 14 wins. You can only go up. They're going to get another high yeah. draft pick next year. I don't even know what next year's draft looks like. I guess we'll figure that out. But they're going to add some players now. If they can, like, double their win total to 28 or so and just be a little bit competitive, then maybe you could start having some guys here to come here. You know what? The trade deadline, Hardaway will probably get dealt. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe Tobias Harris might get dealt. Who knows? He's got $52 million. We just ate $65 million. <laughs> so I, I don't think money is, a, is the issue right now no, for Tom not. Gores. Yeah. I mean – Look how much money this Pistons team is worth. Would they would they sell it? They, he bought it for like three hundred million. It's worth three billion 3. now. Yeah, so just, it's just under three point five. And you know the Boston Celtics are for sale, by the way. Yeah, they're gonna get sold. I, and the guy bought it for three hundred and sixty million. They're gonna go for five billion dollars. So NBA franchises are on the upswing right now. It's a good time to be in the NBA. You're gonna get a new deal here pretty soon, television wise. Uh, things are looking up here in Detroit. That's all. You know what? You're a fourteen win team. You got screwed in the lottery two years in a row, and now you're finally starting to get some semblance of a team. You know you got a coach here that wants to be here, and you got some players that want to be here, and they're going to pay Cade. Word on the street is he's going to get himself a max contract coming up. That's the next move. I don't know if you guys like that or not, but why the hell not? Keep the guy you drafted with your number one pick. You got to do it. And for all those reasons you just spoke of, I do think that the Pistons are finally on the right track. We've got a coach that's right in that pocket in his career where he's ready to take on a franchise without anybody looking over his shoulder and really put his stamp on that team. Now, you just mentioned that you think that they'll double their wins. I'm looking at Vegas, and they say 28.5 is the over-under for the Pistons' wins this year. Where Where do you find us on that? Before I start with that 28.5, I want to get back to you, you introduced the deal, Kate uh, Cunningham and Maz, you brought up again, potentially five years, $225 yep. million dollar deal, max yeah. on the floor. Doesn't necessarily have to be signed this year, but maybe you sign the extension. Where are you with that? Because this is where I start. I like the fact, and I remember this from the press conference, I was listening to this nugget. Trajan Landon said when he came in, evaluation. Mm-hmm. Evaluation was the word he used. Everybody's under evaluation. And by that, I think he means Kate Cunningham as well. Do you want to do, like, non-smart organizations and double down on the question mark that you have? Or do you want to do it like the smart organizations, like the 49ers who got rid of Trey Lance because they knew what they didn't have? Is it a situation where you want to pay this man and be signed $226 million? Or do you want to wait and see if he's worth it? it? It's really an important question. When you look at those franchises, they've been smart so long that they can handle losing someone like Cade. The Pistons are in a position of such a desperate nature mm. in a league where you look at the past drafts and there's three to five really strong players that come out per draft, and those are the better drafts. Yeah. whole lot of you know role players and, and mid guys. But when it comes to landing an all-star caliber guy, and I know he wasn't an all-star yet, but if you look at his numbers, he, he easily matched and probably surpassed the bottom three, four guys on the Eastern roster for mm-hmm. the all-star game. This is the only 
max type player in the NBA that the Pistons can get their hands on, and it's because we drafted him. Yeah, that's a good point. If you lose him, there's no one that you can go out and sign. In order to obtain one, you're going to have to trade how many first round picks that we have that aren't protected because there's a few that that we lose if we fall out of the 12 um the pistons are just in a position where they've been dumb long enough where they can't play like a smart team they have to keep this kid now at the same time we you know a lot of people there's plenty of questions around k but k's been surrounded by children yes with the entirety of the Pistons responsibility yeah. offensively and defensively yeah. and put on his shoulders. And bad so when, when you mix in some of these guys that have um, some experience, some guys like Tim Hardaway, some guys like Tobias, we'll see who else fills in here. With a new coach that figures out how to use Cade, I truly believe that when he's asked to do less, he's going to become much more. You know what? I appreciate that. That actually is that's well said. Because you look at it, that's what we keep talking about. They can't get people to come to play in Detroit. They can't get the top-tier players. They can't get the second-tier players to come here and give them max deals. The max deal that you have is a guy that you draft and K cutting up. And also, too, I think we're looking at money, the big money, and not understanding money is even bigger now. 226 sounds like a ton, and it is and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But now you're getting deals that are about to start being upwards of 600, yeah. 650, yeah. and Crazy. 585. So to your point... I like the deal. You bring K back, and you see what you have in K Cunningham. And also, too, now to answer your question, and I'll take it to Maz after, 28 and a half wins, 14, some injuries. Jalen Doran didn't play a lot early on in the season. I think you have a coach that's going to do some player development. I think the players just naturally get better. We're working with J.B. Bickerstaff. I think the shooting, that wins you a couple more games. Bringing in Tobias Harris, let's say he and Tim Hardaway Jr., let's say that they come and play. Let's say that they're not dealt off or they're not traded before trade deadline. Tobias, remember what it was like here. And then he was remembering like it was when he was in the Clippers, yeah. when he was in the 76ers. If they get the guys to listen to Tobias Harris, if he comes in and wants to maybe take on that role, I think that buys you three, two to three to four more wins. Yeah. And then Tim Hardaway Jr., shout out to the amazing blue, go blue. They just say we look alike. I, I, I never saw. I, I didn't. It was, I didn't say it was a bad thing. You know what I'm You're saying? You're more handsome, bro. Hey, you know, Tim, hold on. Tim, Tim's a little, he's, he's a little homie. Like when yeah, they were yeah. winning. Well, when they almost won, they used almost, to hang out with sir. those guys back in the day. But what is he? Six six? He taller than you? He's taller than me. Yeah, he's I don't think he's about six six. He's but slimmer though. He's he's a strong six five. Yeah, yeah. Play strong six five. But uh, yeah, you get him to play. He's a guy. He's a he's a role player that can come in here and role play. Twenty eight and a half from fourteen. Even with a new coach, new system, new shooting. I'm going over. I know you want to. It's cornbread. I'm gonna fall just a little short. I think okay. twenty six. I say mm -hmm. I, I, it's just tough. It's tough when we've watched them and we've been analyzing these Pistons now, Maz, in this show, what, for four years? Oh, yeah. And we watched 17 wins when they tried to tank. They didn't try to tank and only won 14. I understand the coaching is different. 26 is where I'm at, Tom Mazaway. Hey, man, it's early. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's let them breathe. But you know what? 26 to 30 wins. Yeah. It's no. very feasible. No, no, you're it, it, held it to a be. number. Twenty-eight Over and a half. Okay, fine. Twenty. <laughs> I'll say thirty wins. How's yeah, that? I'm on that. thirty. Thirty right. wins. But there by the go. way, Sham Charny of the Athletic. It is official. Pisses have signed Cade Cunningham. That's right. Okay. Five years, two hundred twenty-six million. Yeah. Face of the franchise. They had and to is, do it. And now also, he's actually got a couple of adults to talk to on the team. Yeah, and the people that want to coach him. You know. Yep. Yeah, and this is good too. I, I think you see this, Casey. You learn from the Detroit Pistons. Yeah. You learn, I mean, excuse me, you learn from, you can't learn anything from them yet. You're right. You learn from the Detroit Lions. Detroit Lions, they knew what they had on Amon Ross and Brown, what he deserves, Panay Sewell, Jared Goff, et cetera. You pay those guys, you mm -hmm. keep the morale high. I think you look at what Kay Cunningham's done when he's played. Like he's played, he's done all that he can, but he's a young guy working with young guys. You've dumped a lot in his lap. I think you've seen leadership skills. Yeah. I think you've seen a guy that plays on both ends of the floor, defense and offense. And I think you've seen the guy that needs help. But wants to be here. Wants is, to be here. And has yep. been professional. Yeah. He has been a young professional the whole time he's here. Pay the man what he's worth. I think this is a, I, I think this is a good contract and he deserves it. Yeah, and he's improved every year statistically. He raised his three-point percentage over the last year. A lot of people want to complain, oh, he's injured, oh, he's this. He had one injury, guys. And, yes, he was out for a year, but he showed this last season that he can stay healthy and be a good part of the rotation. So, I mean, you you had to do it, man. And it'll, people are tripping over the number. You yeah. look at Scotty Barnes, who, yes, he won Rookie of the Year, but hasn't really accomplished much much else. He's getting 270. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, th this is just what happens when you have a rookie on the max contract, man. This is just part of it. But 
they needed to keep K because I'm not in the market of trying to find another 1A or number two player because as it was hard enough just trying to find K. Like, look how long it took us to just get a K Cunningham right. in this organization, man. So lock the guy up. Let's let's roll. That's right. our only number one pick, right? In, in yeah. a long time. You know, two, yeah. two in our take advantage of it. history, 67. Right. Exactly. Take advantage of Jaylen it. Jalen Rose's him. father. Yep. This is very true. All right.